Okay. Yes, boss. Let's call this meeting to order. It's six o'clock on Monday, April 1st. No joke. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yes. Um, do we have any guests online? We have none in the room. Do we have any guests online? No. Okay. Um, well, I'm Terry. I think I'd be a guest since I'm not on the board. Oh, please. <laughs> You're great. <laughs> oh, yes. Hello, Terry. <laughs> yes, there you are. Hi. Okay. Welcome. Um, comments for items not on the agenda? Yes. Um, can we add teacher calendar and snow days? Yes. Okay. Let's put that under... Um, do you want it close to the superintendent's report? Yes. So we could make it um, 3.6A. Okay. All right. For this year that yep. we're in? Yep. All right. We'll do that then. All righty. Anything else? We, everyone in your packet has a copy of our norms and agreements yep. that we will all be civil citizens dedicated to the Career Center. All right. You hear that guy? <laughs> What'd you say, Jim? I said, did you hear that? <laughs> okay. uh, any public comments or any correspondence? Uh, the only correspondence I have was included in the packet, and that was Terry Steele's interest in returning for that one-year appointment for Washington Central at large. Okay. Yay, Terry. So accepted. <laughs> it's later in the agenda. agenda. All right. The consent agenda, the approval of the minutes, students appointee, student appointees to the board, the program presentation, which is coming forward, uh, Washington Central at large interviews and appointments and then committee reports superintendents report accounts payable and the concern with the payroll services so let's begin um, approval of minutes from March 18th 2024 I make a motion to approve the minutes from March 18th 2024 do we have a second I'll second. Jana has seconded. Any discussion? Any corrections? Um, all those you know, in. I didn't really. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. After this. Scott, go ahead. Are well, you? Are you so dealing? Are you dealing my, with um, So my experience with the consent agenda is that there's one motion for everything on the consent agenda, and then if there's something that needs to be taken off to discuss. <laughs> So that the, the, the point of a consent agenda is that we just have one vote rather than nine. It's particularly concerned with the student appointees to the board. Do we have names for them or? Um, Chase Eastman is usually the one that has been attending this year. Yep. And he um, took a job at the Barrytown EMS. Right. And so he has training tonight. So he let me know he wasn't going to be able to attend tonight. Okay. All right. So. So. Um, so that conversation from the consent agenda make one motion and approve all of the rest is that is that okay well what about our program presentation well, we haven't discussed snow days or we'll get there um what about the program presentation um, are they coming both carl and bob are here okay so we'll have that um the at-large interviews um i don't think that's a that that should be separated out the at-large uh, interview should be separated out. All right. So I think the consent agenda really at this point is just 3.1 and 3.2. And the yeah. rest, we would have to uh, hear from the um, presenters. Can I ask? Yeah. Would you like the agenda set up differently? Well, I'd, um, if it's a program presentation, 
Um, are we, do we need to approve that? There's no really no need to approve it. No, and the yeah. appointee has been the same appointee all school year, so okay. for students. Yeah. So it's basically, so three as a, as a consent agenda, we'll have to work on that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll make some adjustments to what is and what is not a consent agenda. Right. So right at the moment, let's just stick with the approval of the minutes. So we have a motion on the floor for approval of the minutes from 3-18-24. Any, no discussion? So we'll go right, we'll, all those in favor? Aye. Say Aye. Okay. Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries. We've already determined, do we, do we need to consider an additional student appointee in case Chase Eastman is unavailable? We have sort of a rotation from the student leadership and um, I think they've just been busy. Okay. So I'll, I'll remind Abby to ask students again. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so we, we can move into the program presentation from emergency services. Greetings emergency, <laughs> services. emergency services. Uh, good evening, this is Bob Bauer. Um, I'm not sure how this usually goes, but uh, so uh, my name is Bob Bauer. I'm the emergency services one instructor and I teach the, uh, the EMT class at the Career Center. Um, uh, the EMT class, uh, uh, we spend all year and we're really focused on getting our students to the point where they will pass a national registry of emergency medical technicians uh, a certification tests. Um, and um, with, that, uh, with that certification in hand, uh, they can be uh, quickly licensed in 48 out of the 50 states across the country. So that's pretty nice. Um, uh, we cover a, we cover a lot of material uh, throughout the uh, throughout the year. You know, we start them right off uh, right in um, in August, the end of August, uh, with doing CPR, and then we kind of continue through all the different uh, aspects of anatomy and physiology. Uh, we spent uh, uh, we spent um, pretty much from uh, Thanksgiving until um, until the end of January talking about medical emergencies, you know, heart heart problems, uh, breathing problems, diabetes, all those kind of emergencies and. And uh, this past month in February, we've been trying to wrap up. Uh, we went through all uh, trauma emergencies. Uh, what's left for the rest of the school year is a bunch of um, uh, kind of miscellaneous topics and EMS operations that get the kind of wrap up uh, the students and get them ready for uh, uh, for their uh, certification exam. To try and help um, the way our class usually uh, usually rolls is we spend about half of our time uh, in class because there's a lot of material that actually EMTs need to need to know a lot of background knowledge, uh, but spend the other half of the time uh, working on our work on our all of our individual skills, whether it be patient assessments, taking blood pressures bandaging wounds, uh, figuring out how to move patients around, um, and then to try and bring it together. Uh, what we do is on uh, Fridays uh, is uh, scenario day for us. And pretty much what I do is I present them with some um, uh, ambulance calls and they take our equipment and all their supplies and they head out and um, I handle it just like it is an ambulance call from start to finish, from dispatch information to caring for the patient on scene to moving them uh, to our uh, hospital uh, back in our classroom where they hand it off to me as the uh, as the, the nurse at the, at the emergency room. So, uh, and the last part that we've been doing that really kind of helps bring it together for the students is that we send them out on ride time. Uh, we have a, a great relationship with the Berrytown you know, EMS Emergency Medical Services. Uh, they run a very uh, busy um, ambulance service here in the um, uh, here in our county, uh, and our students get to ride along with them. Um, it's great when they get to, get to see calls and they see stuff that um, we can talk about in class, but it isn't until you're actually sitting there looking at looking at a patient right in front of you, going, "Oh, that's that's what they meant in class," or "I have no idea what I just saw." Um, and Barrytown uh, paramedics are great in explaining stuff to folks. So uh, that's pretty much uh, uh, about our program in EMS one. Jim, you have a question? Yeah, uh, which two states does it not cover, Robert? Um, so Alaska and New York are the two states that uh, require uh, their own um, their own programs. Uh, there are two other states, Ohio, and I forget what the other one is, uh, where they uh, it's an option whether or not it's national registry. Um, they have their own programs as well, um, but um, NRMT is the, is the way to go. Excellent. Can I? Oh. 
Are there plans for reciprocity that you know of with New York? Um, I haven't. Uh, I haven't really worked with that. I've, we've, I've gone the other way. I've helped other uh, uh, New York EMTs get their uh, Vermont licenses uh -huh. and such. Okay. Uh, but, but I'm not sure what the process is to go back the other way. Yeah. I can answer the New York question. I'm going to also share some photos, Carl, while you answer that that Bob sent me today. Um, New York does accept one time um, national registry for reciprocity, but you have to take um, a transition program over there to be uh, to keep their New York license. So you can come in once and do um, and get your New York license, but then you have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops and hurdles to meet their requirements and to keep your license in New York. Alaska, I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> So a couple of pictures from from class. Here's a class uh, uh, we had um, an outside uh, instructor comes in, uh, someone I work with quite a bit uh, to teach a stop the bleed program, and students are actually here practicing uh, packing wounds. Uh, and you see some tourniquets laid out on the table there as well. Well, so Robert, uh, this is Guy Isabel. Uh, I think you're selling yourself short by not uh, telling the the new board. How many hats you wear and what you do in the community? Um, sure. Um, don't usually like to, to toot my own horn, but uh, yeah. So I'm I'm a um, a national nationally registered uh, certified uh, advanced DMT, licensed in the state of Vermont as an advanced DMT. I work on the Mad River Valley Ambulance Service. Um, I also teach. Uh, I've been teaching EMT classes to adults for the last uh, seven years now, as well as um, uh, helping other classes in our in our ambulance district with their with their classes. Um, I work a regular shift on Mad River Valley Ambulance, and I'm also their training officer. And you were just acknowledged for being a great teacher. Yes, that was very nice. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, obviously, you figured out to manage a 72 hour day. <laughs> um, uh, here's another photo. Yep, uh, this is a scenario day, actually, one of our kind of sunny, warm days that we had um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the students are outside um, and we're actually running a scenario where you. Uh, uh, Steve, who has the uh, the auto program, he has a lot of nice cars over there that uh, all are uh, in various needs of, of repair. And so we uh, we put some students in there and uh, and our uh, rescue dummy, uh, and they practiced uh, extricating patients from uh, from a car, and then uh, how they take care of the patient afterwards. And this is a shot in our class. We're just practicing uh, basic uh, patient movement. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, patient there laying on the floor is actually a, a rescue dummy. He weighs what 160, 170 pounds. So he is a uh, he is a little bit to move. Uh, and the students here are just practicing their technique using uh, that big white sheet that's uh, next to the one student's called a mega mover. It's a great tool for uh, moving patients uh, around who are um, on the floor in different different spots. So just some of the things that we do in class. It's good that we have. Um, We've got the great equipment and plenty of supplies and such, so students get to use uh, pretty much the, the real equipment, the real supplies that uh, they're going to see on, on ambulances. Nice job, Bob. Thank you. And then he passes students on up now to Carl. Sorry. Um, uh, so I'm Carl Madison. I'm the Emergency Services 2 instructor. Um, previously, the Emergency Services 1. Um, and then when we decided to separate the two programs, um, that's how we acquired Bob. And we're very fortunate to have Bob. Um, so my students, um, or this program came about from a a inquiry by a parent a couple of years ago um, when we were looking at adding a second level program and we were looking at just you know doing the advanced DMT so kind of that mid-level provider and a parent said would uh, ask the question could um, the students in the second level program start 
paramedic school. And I'm like, okay, good question. I don't know. So talking to the program director at um, what was then Vermont Technical College, now Vermont State University, um, with full disclosure, I teach for them as well. Um, before we had this collaboration. Um, like, so I talked to the program director who was a friend of mine and I'm like, and I asked that question and she was like, I'm not sure. And we did some research and we were able to make it come to fruition and stuff. So, so now as seniors in high school or first year post graduation is kind of what we're limiting to. So they can, the, if they, are in like EMS one their senior year, they can come back and do the EMS two program, you know, that first year after graduation. Um, we are, we now have students starting, you know, paramedic school at 17, 18 years old, which is in and being seniors in high school, which is essentially unheard of. We're the as far as my research, we're the only program in the country that is offering that to high school seniors. Um, and um, the, and we're the only program, second year program for EMS in Vermont. And um, so it's kind of a unique program and unique enough where that sparked some interest in WCAX and they ran a news story on it a couple weeks ago um, and stuff. So, and my students did a wonderful job talking about it. So anyways, the crux of the program is like, like I said, it's, they are beginning paramedic school, which is kind of the highest certification level. I mean, there's there's specialty levels above that that the paramedic can specialize in, but it's the highest like regular certification level for an EMS provider paramedic. Um, so they they start that. We are doing this in collaboration with Vermont State University because in order to do a paramedic program, it has to be a nationally accredited program so they can test at the end of the program for their national certification um, and then become, and then that will make them eligible. Once they pass that, they will become eligible to be licensed in their state. Um, so, so we have to, so it's, so we have to partner with them to make this work um, because of the accreditation process. Um, so the students are with me four of the five, well, all five days technically, but four of the days we are at CVCC. So Monday through Wednesday, and then Fridays we're at CVCC. On Thursdays, uh, my students and I all go to Williston campus of Vermont State University and work with the other paramedic students um, for a lab day there. So they are there from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon um, uh, every Thursday, um, pretty much throughout the school year. Um, and they, and it's, it's because it's a college program, it's run on the um, college semester. So they are, they have a fall semester and spring semester, and then they actually start the su summer semester before they graduate. So they're, about four weeks through the summer semester by the time they graduate high school. So they're about a third of the way through the summer um, semester by the time they graduate. Um, and then by the end of the summer semester, they would have earned um, 33 credits just from the paramedicine program. Um, what Bob didn't say is the EMT students earned five credits through Vermont State University as well. So, so they've in total, doing the first year and second year program, earn 38 um, college credits. So that puts them over halfway to um, an associate's degree. Um, through, um, so that's uh, that's which is huge. And really, it's just uh, a handful of core courses that they have to do, um, and then they would have their associate's degree, and um, and which will help with you know their future. Um, for promotions or becoming leaders in the EMS industry um, because they, a lot of places like to see them having some sort of degree for that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Guy, I have a question. I'll let Scott go first. He had his hand up first. Thanks, Guy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's, I missed it. It's all good. Carl, that's awesome. Um, the 
cost of the classes um, or the credits are those borne by the um, by our program or is it dual enrollment or is it some other combination of, of sources? Yes. <laughs> it's kind of all of the above. Um, because they're um, earning 12 credits each semester, well, 12 in the fall, 12 in the spring and nine in the summer, it's um, we're working with Vermont State University on that financial side. That's been the biggest challenge to this whole process is is that piece currently they are giving us the high school rate and we're using some of our correct me if i'm wrong jody um some of the our in-house tuition money to support the students for that um correct and we're working on an alternative to make this more sustainable because long term that's not a sustainable goal especially i'm looking at anywhere between seven and 11 students for next year. And that's a significant cost. Um, um, you know, when it's, you know, two last year, four this year, it's a little bit more manageable on those levels. But when we start looking at the larger numbers, you know, and it being a, it's a significant amount of, of, of money and stuff. And it's unfortunately not being fully, you know, supported by dual enrollment fast forward, um, which is what we've been trying to run it through. But there's some complicating factors with that on the state level um, and the Perkins funding. And the, it's yeah, that's been the biggest challenge. Otherwise, it's fully supported on all levels, both at the university and with the career center and um by our advisory board and the public and um it's 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 well well kind of well supported um program we can only figure out that little bit of financial glitch <laughs> um it would make life so much easier and you know cause me less great errors <laughs> all right now guys yeah uh so carl i have the same question for you as i have for for Robert, because I know your credentials are, and you wear many hats, and I think it's important that you know you let the board know, you know what you bring to the table, because I you have two incredible instructors, and I want to thank you ahead of time for, you know, meeting the critical need in Vermont. If you've been reading the headlines, you know, like this is such a huge need. So thank you. So yeah, so I'm. I'm a licensed paramedic in Vermont and I practice, um, I run with a couple of services. I run with Barry County EMS um, and I still run down in Rutland County where I started when I was a high school student. So well, I've been doing this, you know, at the age that my students are. So it's like a full circle moment for me. Um, so I am now teaching students that were, you know, my age, a little older than me. I started when I was 15. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, yeah, so i really enjoying, keep, you know, educating the next generation of EMS providers. Um, and I work, like I said, I work, um, I've been teaching at Vermont State University in the paramedic program for several years and, you know, and now teaching, you know, through the tech center there. So, I mean, in the collaboration, so I'm one of their primary lab instructors on Thursdays when we we're there with my students and the other paramedic students. Um, I, I'm a, I've done some teaching of EMT classes and a lab instructor at UVM in their initiative for rural EMS program there. Um, I've been an EMS instructor since 1990, well, an EMT instructor since 1996, and I was teaching some other lower level EMS classes before that. Um, um, I've been in, so I've been an instructor in doing EMS education for a number of years. Um, I was an administrator um, of an ambulance service for uh, 
the seniors and then last summer, you know, when they ask you, so what did you do on your summer vacation? I was asked to be an interim, be the interim um, EMS director for Barry County Ambulance while they were kind of in between directors. So yeah, that's how I spent my summer vacation. My first day was the day of the flood. <laughs> Fortunately, I had experience when I was in Ludlow and their um, EMS director there. Um, I was in, you know, in charge during Irene. So I had flood experience and used some of my things, tactics I used then and my lessons learned through that to help, you know, with the flooding um, that we had in Barrie and um, surrounding areas that day. So and it worked out really well for us you know, for, our, for that service and stuff. Um, what else do I do? Um, I am in a uh, what, national registry rep. Um, so for any testing for the EMS programs at the end when they do their licensing exams, um, I've been doing that for, well, since, since 2011 when, um, so that's so why I work for through the Department of Health and the National Registry, you know, helping kind of coordinate um, practical exams and a number of other hats that I wear. I'm on the e EMS Education Council, which is part of the state advisory board. So yeah, I have I wear a lot of lot of hats and um, and very kind of deeply involved in EMS and have been like on the local and state level for many years and stuff, so. Well, we, yes, I just, y your students were so, f I was at the, I heard them testify at the legislature and it, it, they were so articulate and so grown up and excited and passionate about the work that they're doing. And I just applaud you. I wonder what you do in your spare time. <laughs> What's spare time? <laughs> exactly. Well, and Thank I would you. say that you are integral also in, in connecting Barry Town EMS with us and getting that ambulance donated um, in exchange for training space and time here at the center, which I think they're going to use maybe for the first time in April during the vacation. I believe so. Yeah, I think that we're trying to make that happen and stuff. Um, and then the most recent thing that happened, I was working with the director at Waterbury Ambulance on a workforce development grant. Um, so um, three of my students are out working in the field. So we are doing kind of a hybrid co-op um, program with the second year students. So one or two days a week, they are working out in the field under the co-op umbrella and uh, for local services in the state or in the in the, in the county in the region um and they so one of them is working at barry town and which is a full-time paid service one of them is working at waterbury ambulance and they um are kind of a hybrid service where some people are paid some people are volunteers considered volunteer um, and because this student is considered a volunteer, um, they get paid like a stipend per call. But through this workforce development grant that we just got awarded, uh, or that Bear Waterbury got awarded, um, the students that are there will be able to get a hourly salary instead of like a stipend once a month um, for going on calls, which is huge for the students and stuff to, you know, kind of earn while they learn. Um, and stuff. So that's that was kind of the latest thing. Yeah, it was a seventy-five thousand dollar grant that they got to do this to support students. Do you know if your students stay in Vermont, or um, are there any that move to other states? Um, of the students that we've had through the program since I've been here, the majority of them that become licensed um, stay in the state, and most Good. stay within the region. Um, which is nice. And that's kind of the trend with, you know, CTE programs. Um, my master's capstone was just on that. I related students, you know, CTE programs and I did EMS. I had to do it kind of anecdotally because there's no direct information about that. But CTE programs in general, students that take, go through those programs, 
tend to stay, you know, if not locally within the state that they went through. Yes, you're always going to have some that leave the state and go other places, but they tend to stay and be part, become part of the workforce of the of the state um, and stuff. And that's been kind of my experience with um, with that. And when I was in high school, there was uh, six of us within a year or so of each other um, that all did kind of EMS in high school. And I think all but one of us are still doing it. And I just passed, just hit my 35th anniversary of doing EMS a few, in February. Oh. So. <laughs> well, very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Any other questions for our EMS people? Alice, can I hand you your phone so sure. you could turn it off? Sure. Yes. Because, is it in this bag? Yeah. Because it keeps ringing? Yes. Thank you. It's a popular lady. <laughs> yes. Okay. What do we got here. Excuse me. <laughs> um, Yes, but anyhow, um, okay. Um, any other questions from the board for our EMS people? Anything? Anything? Okay, very thank good. You both. Yes, thank you all. Thank you. We're so we're so fortunate. Okay, slide power. Okay, we're off. Very good. All right, moving on. Um, the at-large representative for Washington Central. And we have Ms. Steele. There you are. Hi, I've been leaving my video off because my connection is really bad tonight. Okay. So I apologize. Well, we have your, uh, your letter. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if anyone had additional questions for me. That would be appropriate if anyone has any questions for Terry. Guy? Terry, I was your biggest advocate. Why do you want to come back? <laughs> well, it wasn't that I wanted to leave, Guy. Um, <laughs> so I retired from my position. Uh, my work position, and I don't know what the next three years is going to be for me. And so I was in, I was hesitant to run on the ballot and make a commitment for three years that I wasn't sure I could keep. So that's really why I didn't. I didn't. Um, I've got a lot of things going on, so another year is not going to be an issue. Another year will be fine. I just don't know where I'm going to end up after the fall year. I might not even be living where I'm living. So that that's why I, I didn't want to really leave. It was just, I didn't feel I could commit. Well, from a personal perspective, I just want to want to say that I'm glad you're, you know, you're, you're fine and you're a great board member and I'll just end it with that. Can we make a motion to accept her um, application? Application? Letter of interest. Yes. Point her. Point yes. Her. yeah. Uh, yes, we yes, we need a second for that. I'll second that, Jason. Ha. Okay. You're in now, Terry. Any well, any <laughs> discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Huh. You are swept into position, Ms. Steele. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's um, you sworn back in. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So I can, I just have to go down to the town clerk, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. I can do that. I can do that in the next day or two. All right. Very good. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. <laughs> <for> understanding. <laughs> well, welcome back. Welcome back and jump in whenever you see fit. Uh, Thanks. Uh, committee reports. Finance. Is there a finance and facilities meet tomorrow? Okay, finance and facilities meet tomorrow. So we'll get them at the May meeting. Program quality. Uh, we I just shared with 
the board members um, the results of the uh, superintendent survey, um, as well as uh, Jody's self-assessment, um, self-evaluation. And so we'd like you to take a look at that and put on the agenda for executive committee um, to discuss uh, uh, the evaluation at our May meeting. If you didn't get it or you can't open it, let me know. You need to be in your um, Central Vermont Google account in order to be able to open it. Is everyone clear on how to do that? To get into the Google account? And Terry, I can send it to you, uh, I guess, as soon as you're sworn in, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Terry, would you let Mr. Castle know when you've signed your oath and then he can send you the report? You're muted. You certainly will. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Superintendent's report. Wait, I just want to add one more thing, sure. and that's that we're finishing up all the Perkins. Jody's finishing up the information that goes to Perkins, and we'll be able to take it directly from the, that amazing report that was put together. And um, that's kind of our next step, and then we will have completed, Jody will have completed. The, so. Yes, that CLNA was a tremendous amount of work, and I appreciate everybody's, and I'm sure everybody does appreciate everybody's input into that mm -hmm. and how important it is for our grant funding. All right, superintendent's report. So we had a tremendous field trip on mm -hmm. March 22nd, 17 staff members and four of our architects working on the two different teams, two from La Valley Brensinger and two from uh, Trix Collins came with us and there are lots more photos. I can share with you the entire folder if I haven't done so already. Um, I know the facilities committee will definitely have the opportunity to see these and I shared a few in this report, but we saw three really amazing buildings that were built in the last 10 years. And we got some ideas of what we want to do in our center. Um, and we also <laughs> learned some of the things that we don't want to do. They had an advanced manufacturing shop in one of the spaces that had one outlet. Oh, no. um, so we definitely want to make sure that we're planning differently. Some of the really cool things that we saw were some opportunities for like solar energy, uh, solar tubes for lighting in some of the big shop spaces. We really saw um, spaces where the classroom, you could enter the classroom first, and then there was glass between that and the shop. And so then you could enter the shop from the classroom. And that made a lot of sense for the majority of our uh, heavy trades, especially to be able to have some students potentially still working in the classroom. The teacher can still see them while they're in the shop supervising that, which doesn't happen in all of our spaces right now. Um, we, we have it in a few of them, but not all of them. So that was something that was really neat. We saw some equipment that we would love to have. I showed um, in the health professions, there are some of these chairs that would be great for phlebotomy. We don't have any of those currently. So there's all the way down to little furniture pieces that were, oh, we haven't even thought of that to really big, cool opportunities for our students and teachers. We've, yeah, we took a lot of pictures and everybody everybody took pictures that was on the trip and we have the shared um, album to put them in. So I think I did share that actually as a link on that superintendent's yeah. report. So if you click on the superintendent's report in the board um, folder, you can, you can click into those. Um, we finished our second round applications and process and those notifications are going out this Friday, I believe. And so at the end of both rounds, we have 210 accepted students. We also have 16 students that are formally waiting for our welding program to be approved. So that would be uh, 226 students that we would have accepted if we get to that point. And we're still working to see if we can get anyone to uh, apply for design and fabrication. 
You all saw the WCAX piece and that was picked up on the EMS national newsletter. So I shared that also um, with everyone. And then I also shared that because our four largest sending schools were closing on the eclipse day, um, they had several reasons, including the uh, VTRANS recommendation that people stay off the road, uh, local um, police forces recommending that people don't have school and they were closing because they didn't have staffing. And in a lot of cases, they had lots and lots of staff already putting in for that day off. Um, and they were not going to be providing our students transportation. So it felt like I didn't have a choice but to, to follow suit. And I hope it's a beautiful sunny day and we all get to see that. Um, my teachers will still be doing PD virtually that day, at least for half the day from 8 to 1230, um, a little more than half the day, just so that they're still getting that time in. And um, I did ask for a waiver just in case it looks like we have snow coming this week and it could add to our snow days. And so I just want to make sure that that's not counted against us because right, right now we have a, a little bit of wiggle room with the student days. Uh, we're still up above 175, but depending on what happens this week, we could get close or go below it. So um, I requested the waiver for the eighth, just in case. And that waiver goes through the- The Agency, Agency. of Education. Okay, very good. Any questions for Jody? Mr. Isabel. Yeah, just a comment, because I, I did have a question around that because, you know, I, I've sat on negotiations and I know days become a uh, ball, potential ball in contention. So I'm glad you answered the how people are going to handle the eclipse, number one. Uh, and so in terms of the uh, days where you go look at other buildings how is that accounted for is that a training day is that a, a so that counts as a pd day that's a good question so what we've had so far is we've had the two snow days one in november one in december because our best snow has been in the fall and spring um so we had two snow days we had the day that shifted march 22nd from a student day to a professional development day so that's three out of the 180 days that we had originally scheduled for students that are down. And then that eclipse day is a fourth day. So that brings us down to 176 days for students. And if we hit one more, we're right at the minimum. And if we end up having two days out this week, if the storm is extended and it takes that long for cleanup, that would put us under. And so that's why I requested the waiver. The teachers still have 190 uh, contracted days. And each year there's there's stuff that happens like snow days. So they will have done all but two plus whatever if there's a snow day this week. So there are two snow days again. Um, so that's what we need to talk about as far as whether we're going to ask our teachers to go longer in June to make up those two snow days plus whatever happens this week, if anything, or if we're going to waive those days for teachers and that that's what Jana was able to add to our agenda for three point. 6a Th thank you i appreciate that okay. any further questions about school days very good we'll we'll hope that the snow turns to rain is there a recommendation from the board on the snow days that we have had and any future that we might have of whether the teachers should work those or if they're going to be waived. So I'd like to move that we ask the agency of education to waive that time. You know, people just, it's not the agency's job for our teachers. It's yours. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, I move that we waive that since we have the power to do so. You know, people working really hard and doing fabulous work and the eclipse day, nobody has control over. And so <clears throat> I right. think. Right, we have a motion on the floor um, to waive the additional days, non-student days. Correct. For the faculty. I need a second. We have a second. It's not. 
Mr. Monaco, you have a question? Uh, I'm just curious, is that what you want us to do, Jody? I want a recommendation one way or the other. So currently the, the students are done June 14th and our teachers are done June 18th, according to the calendar. If we add on the two snow days that we have, that would be the 20th. If we have one more snow day, that would be the 21st for them if they work their full 190 days that they're contracted for. Okay. That's a good question, Jason, yep. to ask. Lyman, question? Um, on that same note, what would you foresee using those days for? It would be addi additional professional development. Would we, would we program or would it be individual work? I could see, because um, we already have some programming in place for that week, so we're going to be doing the first aid CPR training for all staff so that we're all re-upped on that to make sure we have that. I could see us working on um, some of their work in Canvas, making sure their courses are archived and they can start building for next year and doing some proficiency work. We've also had two consultants that we've contracted with this year um, that we could bring in one or both of them again to do some additional work with our staff so they would be things that we could plan we always do use one of those days as um, a clean out your classroom take care of all your stuff check checklist to like take care of all the end of year things and as a um, full staff activity um, kind of a lunch and celebration piece so we would just move that date for that one potentially so it sounds like you have plans for those two days. I always have a contingency plan, oh, okay. Anna. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you want to um, withdraw your motion? No. no. Okay. I'm leaving it. Okay. So um, we still have a motion on the floor to waive the additional uh, requirement for teacher days. Hmm. And right now that's for two days. It could add any additional snow days. Does not count the eclipse day, does not count the March 22nd day because we teachers are working those two days. Mr. Isabel. So uh, because I can't predict the weather, uh, unlike Jim maybe could, but uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if we could, if we could um, maybe vote on this in May to see where we're at. Is that is that a is that a good suggestion or, or is that I think too late? I don't know about you, but I already have my summer plans booked and I'm worried about the opportunity for teachers to do so um, if they start planning to go away. I would say we have to cap it if we're going to ask them to do those days because the building will have to shut down on the 24th due to the construction that's happening and the power will be shut down for that time in the internet. So we wouldn't go into that following week. So it's really up to three days that we could ask the teachers to do additionally, which is obviously to get to their 190 days. It's not actual additional days. It just feels additional to them because they've had an end date on the calendar for a really long time. Okay, thank you. How, how if at all, does it affect either negotiations of the contract if they only work, say, 187 days? It, it doesn't. I mean, we might say it, they could potentially bring it into negotiations, I guess. It hasn't been, to my knowledge, ever brought up. I don't know if anyone who's in, been involved in negotiations has brought that up. Um, it, it could impact morale if folks weren't expecting this, obviously. Um, and everyone signs a 190 day contract. So they, they technically owe us 190 days as a district. So we can go either way. Last year we waived them. Um, and I think that was probably my fault. I'll take ownership of it because I don't believe I brought it to the board. And then I realized that I had missed that opportunity. Um, and it usually comes before all of our sending school boards, I believe help me if that's not true for all of you so that that decision is made before the april break
Mr. Castle. Uh, so I may have missed this, but just at the end, you were saying our sending schools, um, what, what do they do or do we care what they do or going to do? Uh, it's, it depends from year to year. I have seen different things. So when I worked at Washington Central, I saw sometimes when they added the days at the end for teachers and a couple of times when it was waived, especially during the COVID years, um, cause that was pretty stressful. And now that we're on that, feels like we're on the opposite side of that and coming out of it. The question is, do we start going back to holding folks to what they signed? Um, I think maybe once in the years that I worked in Barry that were they waived and most of the time we worked them all. So I don't know if that's still, I don't know if it's come up for the Barry board yet. It hasn't. I know Caledonia hasn't had that conversation. Okay. As far as I know, I don't know if Cabot has. Mr. Isabel? Yeah, just to let my colleagues know, I'm going to vote against this, uh, not because I'm against it, but because it's negotiated. And if we're not going to honor it, then let's not negotiate. You know, let's not make it an issue. Let's not make it, you know, because it is a bone of contention lots of times. And I like Jody's uh, thoughts of, you know, you know, how to fill those days. And, uh, you know, she's our educational leader and, you know, she's in charge of making sure that you don't have the contract that's negotiated. Uh, so that's my concern about that. So they'll still, they still get the day to clean out the room and they, it's like whatever those end days are, they still get to do what they would have done, whether it's three days later or two days before. So when you say, oh, well, that's the day they clean up their room, they still have that day. Yes. Yes. Right. So I'm sticking with, I'll go to the mat with Guy. <laughs> that was great. That, that was, that was great. <clears throat> so we can we either let the vote. vote. We can we can let the motion die for lack of a second, or someone could second. We could and then vote. Okay. Motion dies for lack of a second. So we will stay with the 190 days for our teacher contract. All right, very good. Moving on, accounts payable. They're all attached. Um, yep. And I believe you get them anyways from Lori when she right. completes them. So if you have any questions, please, right. please ask. Do we have any questions about accounts payable? Do we have the money? Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Good. Michelle, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, last time I had a, pro a question about blanket. Did we figure that out? Uh, we did. And I think I addressed it last time, but just to kind of clarify that, the when it says blanket, it actually is a drawdown purchase order, as in the instructor um, assumes they're going to be spending a larger amount or amount over an extended period of time. And so they'll put in regular um, requests to use that larger amount. So say our baking culinary goes to Hannaford's and they put a purchase order in for $500. Once that's approved, they can use all of the $500 throughout weeks or months and then anything over that, they'd have to get reapproval. But it's just so that they don't have to get approval for $13 and then $75 each time. So that's what that blanket means. Um, and the reason why you're seeing it um, recently and haven't seen it in the past is because I noticed that um, you're kind of seeing everything twice. You're getting the um, actual vendor and how it's paid and the check number and then on the second report it kind of just breaks down all the invoices that were actually paid and it will say 
other specific items. It's itemized. So that's why you're seeing it now. We had a change in accounts payable. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Of course. All righty. Very good. Um, 3.8 is the Career Center Payroll Services. That's a concern. There's information in your packet. And Jody, you want to talk about that? Yeah, back in December, um, we received, and I included them in here, two emails and a letter from three staff members regarding concerns about the BMSI program that we had used for our payroll and accounting, not this current school year, but the previous <laughs> school year. So our first year as a district. And um, we had talked about that, yes, we had concerns with them as well. And the board had agreed that if the union was interested, we would join forces in a letter of, about this. Um, and so Jill had responded as such to the, the um, folks who wrote the letter. And I don't think, I think there was a misunderstanding, quite frankly, and that they thought that the board was just going to write that letter and send it on, on behalf of the board and, and the district as a concern. And so Janine recently reached back out to see where we're at with that and what, if anything had happened and if the company was gonna take responsibility or be held accountable in any way. And um, I said, well, we had hoped that we would join forces on a letter and we never got a response. And she was surprised by that. So she didn't understand. So I just wanted to bring it back to all of you um, because she had sent it to many of you but also to Jill, who's no longer on our board. And so I just wanted to make sure that with so many new people that we had everybody kind of up to speed where this is at. And did I include a draft? Yes. So Michelle had worked on and I had supported that, um, a draft response, that the letter that we could send uh, regarding what happened. Um, and we can go into more detail at some point if you would like um, um, around the communication that Michelle had with this company in particular to try to get things settled and also some of the issues that we've had around audits. Um, but we wanted to have a starting point to draft this and I wanted to bring it to you to get your thoughts on that and if we should then share it with uh, the union folks here and <clears throat> see if they're interested in joining on. Maybe that's where we missed the step in December by not sharing a draft to, to let them know that's what we were thinking. Guy. So Jody, have have the staff who um, probably were affected by this been made whole, or are there, is that still kind of outstanding? Yeah. So, what happened in the pieces where there was an uh, the biggest impact, is my understanding, is that not enough um, money was taken from paychecks. And so they had to pay into the IRS. And I can tell you that I did as well, a lot more than normal. For me, I know some of it was also that my son transitioned from no longer a dependent. So there were lots of things at play. So it's really hard for me to suss out what was because of the software and what was because of that. Um, but for other people, they didn't have that going on. And they, they ended up paying in a lot more than before. Um, a couple of folks had not updated their paperwork and that, I think that played a role, but some of it was the company was using this, at first it was varying system. And so it changed every time. Yeah, Michelle, you can better explain this to folks. Yeah, so as some of you are aware in 2020, there was a new uh, tax filing forms and essentially the point of that is so nobody owes in and nobody gets paid out um, at the end of the year. Um, unfortunately, well, if you were an employer with an employer before, you didn't have to fill out new paperwork, you could keep your own paperwork. When we became our own district, everybody needed to fill out new tax paperwork. Um, so that that had an effect, um, whether how people were filing, just the normal changes, but also this company really um, made some some errors on on their end. Um, everybody is whole as in nobody's owed money. The government isn't owed money on behalf of the district or anything like that. It just felt 
um, really unpredictable with paychecks uh, because, again, there was varying amounts. And of course, um, to give you a little bit more information, you know, uh, we voted to become a new district in March. We needed to come up with a new financial system by July 1st. That was really hard to do. We weren't able to use BUUs. BUUSD's financial system. We had to come up with an entirely new one. So this is the one they gave, they showed us everything that we wanted to see. And throughout the entire year, we had nothing but issues. Um, I addressed the board in November of last year, November of 2022. Two. So yeah, not last year, the year before that I I could see that this issue was going on. We went out for uh, proposals and that's why we have our new system that we have today. It's because we could see it happening early, early on between the issues and the paychecks, which that is what um, these staff members are bringing up. But as a business manager, I listed also the other reasons that I have The reporting was inaccurate. We're not even done with our auditing of the 22, 20, three fiscal year because we're not able to get all the information that we need. Uh, the company with BM BMSI, which was a local-ish company out of Franconia, New Hampshire, they've sent sold to a larger company called G-Works um, and it, it's getting a little bit harder to navigate. Unfortunately, because the system um, was absolutely inadequate, we did tell them in March that we were going to discontinue services. Um, but, you know, one thing that we were struggling with was we still need access to the system in order to pull out uh, all of our data. So we struggled with that as well. So it's it's not just, um, yes, that's the biggest concern was pay people's paychecks, but that's not the only concern. This, it's a much larger, um, there were much larger issues going on with the software as a whole. Have we been able to solve those issues or are they still outstanding? We've been able to solve them mostly with um, a lot of Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we've also uh, changed our financial system to a uh, more reputable system. A lot of Vermont school districts and CTE centers in Vermont are using this. Our auditors are well aware of it. Our auditors were able to work. We actually have this, uh, it's RHR Smith that we're working with us. There are auditors, but we also have an independent contracted agreement that they'll help, that they were able to help us come in and do some um, entries for our previous fiscal year to get that kind, kind of cleaned up. So. We're definitely on track, but it was it it was not acceptable. It was not acceptable, and I do think that that um, you know the board and could <laughs> you know let them know that it it's it's wasn't a pleasant experience, and it has cost time and money, and you know. Okay, guy. A question? So, Jody or Michelle, are you recommending that we at least send a letter of this consent? Yeah, and that was what the board had agreed to do back in December. And so, Jill had sort of sent that note to the three folks who had sent letters. Um, and I think it just it got lost in translation that we were looking to sign on with them collaboratively and felt like it would be more meaningful. So I'm happy for us to just send a letter from our district um, and the board, or we can try again to be collaborative and get everyone signed on. And that's why we decided to present a draft to you. Mm -hmm. Would this go to all staff or just to the staff who have raised concerns? Um, our thought was that the union might want to join us and it might be stronger. So I would make I would make that motion that we do that with Jody's and Michelle's recommendation. And another thing to add to that, our our auditing team is also willing to collaborate with us on this letter. 
because of the extra work that they've had to do that they their two cents is valid and they are more than willing to to add on with us i will add that to my motion how's that okay we need to clarify your motion mr isabel so your motion is to so it's uh it sounds like uh we need to send a letter of discon our uh, our uh, complaint to this organization including the administration the the staff and the auditors, if I get that correct, Michelle. Um, I'm understanding. I know it's time to time that. Is it? With the, um, with the um, union yeah. and others to to support and add more weight to to the letter. Yeah, I guess, and we would be willing to send it regardless. Yeah. yeah. They choose not to. Right. So this base, this letter basically explains what has happened with this financial management company mm -hmm. and what the district has done to rectify that. Okay. And I have one last one last question, Jim. Here, the, yes. the email from March eighteenth from Jocelyn. Yep. Is this letter that we're drafting to uh, go right to her concerns that are in this email? I think for the March 18th, I mean, that's concerns there has there been any progress and there hadn't been. Um, okay. So there hadn't been resolution. There was, if you go back further to her December 7th one that was discussed right on December 13th. Um, yeah, I read that. Yeah. If I'm looking at the bullet points, it basically points out that yes, this did happen. These errors happened. So yeah. there were unexpected taxes. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who had to pay a penalty. It doesn't mean there wasn't, but I'm not aware of any. Um, the 403B contributions were not the results of that company. They were the results of a staff member who no longer works for us. I'm not sure about the, this October, 2023 one is a new, the new software. So Michelle, you might need to speak to that. And I can say that not all employees had correctly completed their W-2s. Right. Um, the majority had, but not all. all right. So the only one I'm not sure about is the October 2023, mm -hmm. the paychecks changed um, something about a deduction code. So I think we've right we've righted that. Right, and I mean, you guys were directly affected, right? I mean, you and Michelle were both yeah. directly affected. So, yeah. do you feel that the organization has done the right thing, chasing down this BMI, BMSI company, and so on and so forth? We haven't chased them down or reported them to like the attorney general's office, which I think would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done that. We were sort of waiting um, and then it kind of fell off the, the table and off our radar. Nobody like the money that we had to pay into the government, like the money I had to pay in that didn't come out of my paycheck mm -hmm. was still money I owed. It, Right. I got paid the money. I just didn't realize that maybe I needed to set more aside because it wasn't taking out enough at the time. Right. And that, and I sort of had a suspicion for me because I had that other issue going on at the same time. So it was really hard to say. And I think there's a variety of things that happened, but I believe that has been fixed. I believe the new software is accurate. I definitely saw a difference this year that felt more appropriate. 
I'm not sure if any employees didn't see that. Um, and I, Carl, I see you're still here, so I'm not gonna make you speak, but perhaps you can speak to it. I know Stephanie is taking our minutes. Perhaps she can speak to whether this year um, worked out for tax season better and is more in line with where it should be. It's also hard because of that transition in the IRS of how it's done and so that they're trying to avoid having to send large amounts of money back to people. And so they changed this, the, um, what is it? The method or the amount that however they decide that. So that was a, a transition that happened at the same time. So all these things, it was like the perfect storm. I feel like we could do more to make sure that people are aware that this company did things wrong. I don't think there's a way there's anything that is owed to anyone like financially, despite how uncomfortable and it felt. I guess that was my biggest concern was to make sure that, that everybody's whole, like guy had brought up and whatnot, and that you guys, because you're directly affected, feel represented or whatever. But we, we're leaving this in a good way. That's all. It sucks you had to go through it. Mr. Yeah. Madison? Um, so I last year I paid in a significant amount more than I've ever paid in ever. I only ever paid in one other time in all the years that I've been filing taxes, which is since I've been a teenager. Um, so last year was the second time. The first time it was only a few hundred dollars. Last year was several thousand dollars that I paid in. This year, I actually am paying in more than I paid in last year. Um, just, just for the record. Um, I, I thought I had taken steps and I worked with Michelle, you know, last year, you know, to try to mitigate that. And even the steps that I took didn't help. And some of it is the tax law changes, some other, there was a whole cascade of things that happened and stuff, but it was, you know, a, certainly something I was not expecting um, to happen and stuff. So it's led to a whole lot of other um financial struggles a little bit not struggles i shouldn't say that but i mean it just it took a huge financial hit in um because of that and now this is the second year in a row that i'm doing that i'm having as much of a hit as last year or a little more and stuff so it just was I'm still working on trying to navigate it all and figure it all out as to why this is happening two years in a row thank you carl do we still use this company? No. No. Okay. That's my question. Okay. Uh. No, we switched to Tyler Financial, which is what we wanted in the first place. Um, and it's the one that the USD uses and a lot of districts across the state. When we originally had looked at them, it was they were not going to be able to get us up and running until January 1st of 2023, which was halfway through that fiscal year. And they, it was going to cost us $75,000, which we didn't have that kind of startup money in May of last of that first year of right. becoming a district. Um, we were able to get it for 50000 It was significantly less when we finally were able to sign on and they were able to get us up and running by July 1. Okay. So if we said point. that in the letter that we're now working with. Do we need to add that in our letter? No, we're no, no, I don't think it says here anywhere that we are no longer using this company. Okay. Yeah. I think that needs to be included. Yeah. Perfect. We can we can make this into a if it's not already a shared document so that you can suggest edits. Okay. But you'll add that anyway. Yes. Yeah. So um so, if we so, enjoy, oh. so Madam, Madam Chair, just, you know, my my motion is just want to make sure that we go on the record of uh, you know stating our displeasure with what happened, and uh, I think we need to do that uh, it as a matter of record. And I would let Michelle and Jody and you know whoever wants to sign on the letter, uh, you know to you know to do that. Uh, because you know, some people were were harmed 
you know, and yeah. people aren't happy. So. Okay. All right. So the motion on the floor is to send a letter to the staff about the business management systems Inc. Um, and how the uh, district has reacted to their um, failure right, to, they respond to, to yeah. properly manage um, the, the payroll. Jason. Uh, it's staff and the union. Is that right? So we wanted to um, send a letter to BMSI. Right. Regarding these concerns and also potentially to whatever agency in the state was best to report this to okay. in oh. collaboration with them. Right. So, um, Okay, let's deal with it with, with in two areas. So we'll send a letter to um, BMSI. This this is the letter we have in our packet, correct? Right. Yeah. All right. Um, did we? Get, I'm sorry. Did we get a second for Mr. Isabel's motion? We did I, not. I was curious about including um, the union and trying to get them to sign on, as long as with the staff. Before we send the letter, well, the the union would be representing the staff. Okay. So, and that would be the letter that would go to the company. Right. Would be from the board, the um, administration, and the union. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. So, and that's what we're working in. We're working with right now is the letter to the company. Okay, I'll second that. Okay. Very good. We have a second. Any further discussion? Yeah, so just a clarification. I, I like that uh, staff and union because I'm not sure that all staff are part of the union. Well, let's uh, hold that thought, Guy. Okay. 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 All right. Laman, you have a question? Nope. Okay. Um, so all those in favor of sending a letter to the, the BMSI uh, financial management company uh, in regard to their handling of payroll, please say aye. 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 Hey, or uh, approve. Any nays? No. So we'll approve this letter. Then I think there would, this we're, is. We're going to add that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With the, the, okay. And then. Um, a question that comes up as a result of this letter, do we need to send a letter to staff saying what we have done, that we have sent a letter um, of dissatisfaction to this company and on, on their behalf? Yeah. All right? So, I move. all right, so jo uh, Jana would make that, that motion that we send a letter to staff explaining the actions that we have taken with this financial management company. We need I'll, a second. I'll second that. that, Lyman. Lyman second. Oh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Good. I think we've covered all our covered all our bases to make sure that everybody is informed. Right. Okay. Now, um, and we'll do that. All right. Go back to the agenda. Um, that's, it. that's it. We'll deal with the, the superintendent evaluation becomes a future agenda item. For May. Yeah. I think is it an executive session agenda item? Yes. Right. But we, we'll have that. On, so everyone has that information. If you don't have that information, I'm going to point to Lyman <laughs> that if you don't have that information, uh, Lyman can assist you in getting it um, to you. Or if you're having difficulty opening it, opening it, he will be able to assist you. Please review that so we can have a um, good discussion of how that was created and what it means to our administration. Very good.
Um, uh, additional future agenda items, we have board development and goal setting for June, placement in the workforce from programs. Um, we will discuss that with the um, co-op coordinator and we'll have program presentations throughout the year. Now, any reflections or summary of our meeting and our next step? Is everyone clear where we're going for the month of May? Very good. Um, Terry. Ex excuse me, Mr. Isabel, I missed that. I said, welcome back, Terry. Oh, yes. Okay. Very good. Yes. Welcome. Um, we don't need an executive session. We'll take that off. And then we need a motion to adjourn. Oh, by the way, welcome back, Jason, too. Yeah, I made it. Yay. <laughs> you, have a, you have a school and you have a representative. Two yeah. yeah, it was easy. I just said I wanted to do it. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate having a full board. All right. Um, now, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Thank you. Second. Second. It's non-discussable. All ah. those in favor? Well, I'm in two feet. Aye. Two feet. Aye. Two feet. Aye. Two feet. <laughs> two feet of snow. Thank you.